Um, I don't know if you've mentioned here the five pillars of our Raymond Christie life, which is reduced to this list that involves all what we do as Raymond Christie members. Spiritual life, prayer life, formation, apostolate, personal accompaniment, and team life, no? But um, I would like to make a little detour here and reinforce a little explanation before going to the structure of the team and the commitments. Because I understand that here with us, we have people discerning whether they are called to be Regnum Christi members or not. And the first time I did this presentation, it was meant for current RC members. And I was troubled by the lack of meditation that we do around the importance of team life. Re I mean, instead of going directly what a team is, I would like to talk to you a little bit before of what a team is meant to be and why we have teams in our own spiritual uh, family. And I was thinking a little bit about God before doing this, this little talk. And I said, well, the God, our God, the one that we believe in, is not alone. He doesn't live by himself. Uh, there are religions that believe that God is one that is over there ruling the world and the universe. But we think that he does that, but he's not alone. And the fact of having three persons and one God reveals the true nature of God, who is love. Love cannot be isolated in one individual, put it over there in a corner, and live by himself alone. Because love requires interaction, requires contact, requires movement, requires relationship between two or more, at least. So the, the Holy Trinity reveals that God is love and is not alone. And in his plan, he waves part of his almighty power to contribute with us in his plan. I mean, to put us in in, an, in a very important place to work with him in order to develop his plan for salvation. And that it's also a, a hint that we are created by his image. Because since we are created by his image, we are capable of love. And we can respond to God's love in that way. So, there is, uh, we base all our faith in, in, in the scripture and we are a book-based religion. Like the Islam, for example, that is a book-based religion too. But our scripture also tells us that God wants us to include us in his plan. Because it is uh, believed that Moses, for example, wrote Genesis. And Genesis is the word of God, with no doubt. But there is a lot of Moses there. And there is a lot of Luke in the Gospel of Luke, even though the Gospel of Luke is the word of God too. So you can see the collaboration of the human being included in God's plan 
And that's the way he wants to do things. Uh, he waves his power in order to include us. He doesn't need us. I mean, he's sufficient enough and, and his, our presence in the world is not needed for God. But he wants to wave his power to use us because he wants a loving respond from us. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the way he works. Our, I mean, for our salvation, he became man. And that's the quintessential manifestation of God's will towards relationships. I mean, he, he wanted to be one of us with the limitations and with the, with the whole problem of being human, with the, you know, the weakness, the, the fragility, the, all, all the problems that involve being, you know, in this world uh, that is, you know, limited by time and matter. And, and he accepted to come. And he could come he could have come in a cloud and resolve all the problems with just one click. But he, I mean, his plan is not doing that. He came here, he suffered, he shared with us. And he's always including us in his plan. And probably his plan would be more efficient and m more perfect if he doesn't include us. I mean, because we, because of us, the plan is not completed because we are failing and failing and failing. And, but that, that's, that's the way he wants us to work with. So he wants collaboration from us. And that's the reason of his love. And that's the reason we, in Regnum Christi, are you know meant to be a movement of teams so there there are um, there are many many examples of god um, you know trying to work with us from the very beginning and and the the only you know um, fact that he became man reveals that that's the way he wanted to do it so Jesus chose 12 apostles. Do you think he really needed the 12 apostles to, you know, do his plan? I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm super uh, appalled when I read in the gospel that Jesus was talking to 4,000 people and there was no microphone. <laughs> and how the guy at the end of the 4,000 people heard what Jesus said. Well, because he didn't need a microphone. I mean, that's part of a, of, a, of a hidden miracle over there, you know, working. He didn't need, I mean, microphone or, or the 12, you know, fishermen that were around him. And, and I mean, there is no need for that. It's, it's kind of crazy thing that God is, you know, being one of us with the limitations and trying to include us to to develop his plan that's but the, the only explanation is love because he wants us that we freely love him back and that's the only way we, we could do it so the miracle of of cana i mean the preparation of the last supper go and prepare the sup i mean he could have done you know okay the supper is ready like Daniela does. Uh, the, the, the miracles, the, the um, Simon of Cyrene. Oh, I mean, you have, since the very beginning of the incarnation, you have a God that is uh, limited to human realities. And that's something to be, you know, taken, taken care into consideration to, to see what Regnum Christi and teams uh, are so 
uh, we follow that, and we follow uh, we follow that idea of working together and working for God in order to be faithful Christians. So imagine in my case, for example, you have a little gr group of men, you know, working in their offices and, and living early on Wednesdays uh, without much explanation in order to get to a place where, you know, he meets other men doing the same thing in order to pray. Uh, and sometimes you are in a WhatsApp chat, you know, coordinating things that are related to your spiritual life, and you're coordinated those things with others. And, and you listen, you know, God's words and, and the view of the world in the light of the gospel, and you get a team commitment, and that's very rare. I mean, we, because we are within the thing, but but explain that to someone else around. I mean, it's like, uh, so that's, I, I think this is the most beautiful part of being a Regnum Christi member, is, is that interaction, is that, uh, you know, working together or feeling together or suffering together. We, there is a quote in the Regnum Christi member handbook that you know summarizes a little bit what I've said. It says, ordinarily, you do not leave your calling and membership in Regnum Christi in isolation. The movement is above all a true spiritual family in the church. Therefore, the life of its members unfolds in the framework of spiritual communion and fraternal charity as happens and has always happened in the church since the early Christianity. This reality takes concrete shape by belonging to a team, which is a small group of members who mutually help and encourage each other to live a better life, persevere in their Christian vocation, and be more effective in their apostolic activity. And I will stress that the end of this phrase is not always the case. And I've said that before. Sometimes it's better, more effective, and faster to do apostolic activity one by ourselves without depending on teams. I mean, sometimes it's easier to do good things uh, by ourselves and not trying to force others people will in order to do apostolate or you know being forced of walking at the pace of the lower of the team and not at the fastest sometimes it requires patience and charity and love in order to work as a team and, but that's part of the thing. I mean, we don't make teams to be more efficient. We make teams because we need to encourage each other to live a better life, persevere in our Christian vocation, and sometimes be more effective in our, in our apostolic uh, activity. So at the beginning, in Regnum Christi, the teams were called team of perseverance. <laughs> and and if you and if you see the the documents at the beginning you will find that term equipos de perseverancia in spanish and um, the truth is that yes sometimes you need someone else to be waiting for you on wednesday nights to feel compelled to go and not to you know let some, somebody down there waiting for you and suspending the encounter because you didn't show up. Or 
trying to be a good friend and not limiting your friendship to uh, sports and barbecue, but to include your spiritual life within the topic of conversation with your friend, which is quite important. So sometimes then the, the teams uh, were called encounter teams because we do the encounter with Christ, which I will explain a little bit uh, in, in a minute. But that's also reduction because when you reduce the team to the encounter with Christ, you, you're living out of the team friendship, apostolate, formation, and why not some entertainment that must be included in the intro formation and, and life of RC members. So uh, teams are like little families. Teams are to be, uh, are called to be examples of charity. And like small families where everybody's needed, everyone is valued and everyone suffers. I mean, if someone is missed, the team is hurt. Like the family, okay, that sets a table and one chair is empty. I mean, the mom that, you know, made a Sunday lunch and the kids are, you know, living outside the, the house and they're waiting one and, and the eldest, for example, you know, didn't show up. Teams also must be safe environments for all, like families. I mean, I brought my son here and uh, it's, I think, I hope, it's important to live in a family where all members within the walls of our family can be who they really are. Because outside, you are forced to accommodate yourself in a bunch of situations. I mean, when you go to school, when you go to your work, you need to be, you know, what you're supposed to be. But within the walls of your house, you're free to be yourself. Well, that's the same with teams. I mean, you don't have to pretend being someone else. You're called to be who you really are because you're valued in that way. So, um, not everyone will be, you know, smooth. Not everyone will contribute to harmony. But families are like that. True love is not, a, is not everlasting peace. I mean, thinking that love is, you know, being without any conflict or frustration or being worried about someone else. It's not, it's not the way God wants us to understand what true love is. It's easier not to care about others. But that's not God, what God wants from us as Regnum Christi members. We are supposed to struggle with our teams, to wish them better, to wish we're, we increase our numbers. There is no perfect team. It will never be a perfect team, never. We'll die complaining about our team. <laughs> and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's very important to understand that because sometimes we, you know, forget that we won't have a perfect team. Never. What the team makes is that it must improve, it must improve our charity and our patience and our love. Teams are not meant to make us efficient or successful apostles. There is no successful apostles. I mean, 
try to find in the gospel the word successful or success. All the apostles died, you know, in a very critical, brutal circumstance. I mean, there is no human success there. Quite the contrary. So if you enter into a team, if you are called to be a Regnum Christi member and you enter into a team, be fully aware that team life is not an easy thing. It's better for you to understand that from the very beginning. <laughs> Nobody told me that when I incorporated 25 years ago. I mean, really, really. Uh, sometimes working alone is the shortest, easiest, and fruitful way to do apostolate. It is, sometimes. I mean, you, you probably will see fruits faster if you do things alone. But that's not the way God wants us to work with him. Teams sometimes are the crosses. We need to realize that God is in command. That we need to, to, we need to leave our pride and self-sufficiency away in order to fulfill his plan. So, um, teams are the cornerstone of the movement. We are not a movement of RC members. We are a movement of RC teams. And um, as a community, that growth in faith together, we pray together. And the encounter with Christ is the main activity we perform as our teams, and it's mainly a communitarian pray. It's getting together to pray. It includes a lot of other things, but the first main thing is praying. A team is a community of virtue in development, charity, faith, patience, humility, compassion. A team is a group for support and perseverance, a friendship and above all confidence. I mean, sometimes we need to adapt. Sometimes teams need to accommodate themselves. Sometimes the team leader cannot force into one particular structure because one of our team members is, you know, in need of talking about other things. So when you have intimacy, when you have prayer life, when you have compassion, generosity, humility, charity, well, friendship should come. And since we have a very little locality, our teams sometimes are very, you know, uneven. You have members that are retired and going to the same team to some members that have little kids. And that, uh, that is a source of tension sometimes. And it requires, you know, understanding and, and patience. But that's the way God is building up our, our souls so it, with, with those elements, with, with precisely those elements. Not about, you know, the gospel reflection that I do, which sometimes I feel like, wow, this gospel reflection that I just made was amazing. <laughs> like, wow, and sometimes like, Wow, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> and sometimes you have to listen to the gospel reflection of others saying like, what is this thinking about? But you know, trying to, trying to get what that member is, you know, that light that that member is getting, it's, it's an important task that God is asking you to do. So, yeah, that's the way of team life, uh, pretty much. So the encounter with Christ, uh, I put there a phrase from 
uh, from the manual. It's, the manual is a document that was prior to the handbook. And it says, if you could read, the purpose of the encounter is to help us meet the living Christ, our Savior, Savior more intensely each day by applying what we read and meditate on in the gospel, by analyzing our personal fidelity to apostolic and spiritual commitments, and by contemplating contemporary occurrences in the light of the gospel, we come to recognize Christ walking by our side. And the encounter, who hasn't been in an encounter here? Everybody has participated in an encounter. The encounter, it's an interesting activity that it's like the core of our activities as a team. It begins, as you know, with an opening prayer, and then we have a gospel reflection. And um, when, we, when we do the gospel reflection, I have witnessed grown-up men behaving like, like children, uh, facing God's word and, you know, suffering the, the impact of having a real encounter with Christ in front of ten unknown people. I mean, for the first time, people arrive into an encounter with Christ. Well, what, what, would, what do we do here? Well, we read the, the gospel and then you say whatever you want to say. And the guy, you know, crying because they've never before in their lives read the gospel and were supposed to reflect of what Christ is telling you with, the, with that uh, gospel with that particular gospel. Because sometimes the shield that we use is to have a very intellectual approach to the gospel. So we read the gospel and we say, well, you know, 2,000 years ago when Christ was living, the society there, it was very common to have, you know, these people that were called the Pharisees, that their customs were so perfect. And you begin, you know, like a little talk, it's like, like you're teaching, you know, all your thoughts and your knowledge, but you're missing the point that Christ is telling you something about your own life that you need to address. And if you don't feel comfortable with that, that's something that you need to work on it. And the team, since it is a safe environment, should be a support to, you know, to let you encounter with Christ in that way of, you know, feeling, listen, I have been, you know, having struggles about this and then this gospel, you know, answers my questions and you share your struggles and, and that's beautiful and that's the way it should be. Then we review the commitments and we do a spontaneous prayer. In my team, when, when I am team leader, I always say that the spontaneous prayer is very spontaneous, but I, I appoint the one that <laughs> makes the prayer because it's hard for us to talk to God in front of other people. I mean, if you say, well, if someone is willing to do a spontaneous prayer, the silence that you will face there it's embarrassing but it's not because you don't want to do it it's because you are not used to talk to God in front of everybody but teams are meant to be the safe environment for us to do these kind of things so that's why I appoint people then you have a case study um, where you read the signs of your times in the light of the gospel and then 
we have a resolution or a team commitment. Because the encounter with Christ is not only a prayer or communitarian reflection of the gospel, but also a, an opportunity to think about what can I do to bring the kingdom of Christ to this world? And what can we do as a team? Sometimes my team, you know, get, some, get to some uh, easy to do resolutions. But they are, but they, they might be very uh, important for God. I mean, sometimes I remember we had an encounter that led us to a team resolution of praying at a very specific time, all the team members of that team, and we set our alarms in our, in, in our cell phones and we, you know, pray together for a week at, I don't know, 11.20 a.m. No matter what you're doing, I mean, just stop and have a little prayer for a particular thing. And those, I mean, it seems to be pretty easy, but sometimes, sometimes it's the best we can do. In certain situations, as, a, as la, like the case study may lead us. So, um, in the structure of the encounter, we review the commitments, and this talk should be called uh, how, how is it called commitments to regnum Christi and team life. Yeah. And I was reluctant to talk about commitments, but my boss Alicia told me that I should. <laughs> and. Um, of course. <laughs> of course. Of course. Of course. Oh, look at those pictures. I took it from Tima's presentation. Um, of course I will. Listen, when, when I incorporated in Brain Increase, I was 15 years old, and I sent uh, you incorporate, at that time you incorporated by sending a letter to the general director. And in my letter, I asked for a approval because I was 15, not 16, and in the church, 16 is considered an adult, but 15 not. So, and I couldn't join at 15, so I asked for an approval of being a Regnum Christi member before I got 16. And my team leader at that time, is, he's now a priest, Father Julio Martí, he gave me, I remember, I remember that we went to Instituto Cumbres de Caracas, a, a Reino Christi school in, in Venezuela. And in the basement, there was a box, and he took a little blue card that you open in three, and in that card, there was a, a little paper with the, the commitments. And he, with a blue pen, mar he was like 20, and I was 15, so imagine. He marked a little blue dot on those things that he thought could be my first, you know, commitments as Rain and Christie. But commitments at that time were not the ones that are in our, you know, card of commitment cards. It was the prayer life that we had and we are already have in our handbook. It's the means of spiritual growth that is like praying, mental prayer, morning offering, you know the, those? Uh, when you incorporated you had a list of morning offerings, mental prayer for 10 to 15 minutes, gospel reading and reflection, uh, mass, communion if possible, the angelus, the um, a mystery of the rosary, uh, doing the balance, all the things. Weekly you have to do this, monthly that. And he marked those, those commitments, those means to me. And I was deeply 
excited, deeply excited. Because for the first time, I was, you know, feeling like an adult, like, okay, I have to commit and this, I mean, you, you have to do your mental prayer and he explained to me what mental prayer was. Your mental prayer, the Angelus and the mystery of the rosary, every single day. And I was pretty faithful doing it and God had his plan of to my soul to develop something within me by doing those things. Now, nowadays, we have a commitment card with um, more general commitments because those means are meant to be said with your spiritual director and in a gradual way like it was made to me when, when I began. I mean. I, when I incorporated, I didn't commit to do all the list of the things. I was, you know, guided by someone else who knew me and said, well, this is too much to you. You need to, you know, baby steps before. And, 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 hope, and gladly, they created this list of commitments, which are the core of our, you know, being a, an RC member and you'll have a card with you it's super little you all know them but I mean I'm just trying to fulfill what Alicia told me to do <laughs> but yeah because I don't want I mean the problem is I don't want Raymond Christie members you know saying well if you want to be a Raymond Christie members this is what you want this is what you have to do this must be a response to a response to what God is telling you to do because he created you to love and to love him back. So the whole point here is that those seven commitments that you will see there are ways to respond to God in a faithful manner. And those are the commitments that we review in our encounter with Christ. We used to review the, the other ones. I mean, when I was a kid, the, the commitments that we reviewed was like, did you pray the rosary? Did you have your, your, did you have your meditation? Did you pray the, the, the Angelus or Regina Celli? Did you do something? And those are like means to grow in your spiritual life. But these ones are the core of every Regnum Christi member that you should read, put into practice, and develop within your life. And it's your responsibility to do it. And you will have the support of your team and the support of all their RC structure around. But that is the, the core of every Regnum Christi member that you you know, put into practice. And as a conclusion, I'm not sure about the time. Four minutes. Four minutes, perfect. <laughs> the conclusion to this, you know, little talk that I've been doing and you've been suffering by hearing is that um, Jesus formed a team of 12. That was his team. He didn't need a team. But, you know, he did it. And sometimes, some members failed. Like Judas or Peter, who denied Jesus. Or the one who sold Jesus to the Jews. Sometimes, some members didn't attend to the meeting. And you remember last Sunday gospel with poor Thomas that wasn't there but they were teams I mean they formed a team and later they were all around the world spreading the word of God 
evangelizing, forming new teams, new communities. Uh, St. Paul was an exceptional team leader. He was forming teams all around, you know, Asia. And, and wrote letters to communities and formed new members of the early church. And today's, today le uh, Paul's letters are, you know, the light of the church. So we have examples of teams that with their failings, they do great things. So my, my, my encourage to you is to fight the good fight for Christ, the not be discouraged, the focus on your team, on your prayer life, on your community, your friendship with your teams, and not get frustrated by the failings because, because you will never have a perfect team. And if you have the perfect team, you should get out of that team <laughs> and form another one because it's not helping you with, with the cross and the frustrations that requires you know to be a faithful apostle that is not there because he's having such a great time with a bunch of friends that everybody thinks the same, but struggling with, you know, the weaknesses, the suffering, the problems of the other, to listen the other, to be there for, for, for their team members. And that's the way we become good RC members, not by, you know, fulfilling things or, or doing a checklist, but by suffering, by being there, by putting our, you know, our two cents there for others. And, and that's the way we will be fulfilling God's plan in the way he wants. That's it. Thank you.